Um, good evening, uh, Provost, Senior Lecturer, Fellow Dean, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, you're all very welcome. Uh, my name is Brian O'Connell, Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, which is hosting this inaugural lecture, a tradition afforded to full professors in Trinity College. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Mark Cunningham, who will shortly present his lecture, Hacking the Brain, Accelerator, Novel Therapies for Epilepsy. Mark is the Ellen Mayston Bates Professor of Neurophysiology of Epilepsy in the School of Medicine, a position he's held since coming to Trinity in 2018. This is one of two chairs supported by a generous bequest from Mrs. Bates, who died in 2009, the other being the chair in epileptology, which is held by Professor Colin Doherty. In addition to being Professor of the Neurophysiology of Epilepsy, Mark runs the Neuronal Oscillations and Epilepsy Research Group and is a funded investigator in the Future Neuro Project. He is a visiting professor in the University of Newcastle, a member of several multi-center research projects and a co-founder of Neuro Ablana. So while his main focus is the study of epilepsy in an ex vivo system, as he will tell us about shortly, Mark's abilities are multidimensional. Having ongoing collaborations with Colin Cunningham in TCIN, Helen Sheridan in NatPro, Matt Campbell in genetics and others. He works closely with the neurosurgeons in Beaumont Hospital, Donna O'Brien and Kieran Sweeney, who are key to his main research theme. And I understand this is a long way from the early days, and I'm told you had to put a tie on to approach consultants to get them to help you with, the, <laughs> with their work, with your work. In a short time here, which of course included the pandemic, Mark has had a very significant impact on Trinity and indeed the research community in Ireland. He has published prolifically, won a very healthy amount of funding and is mentoring students and junior staff. He's actively involved in professional organizing and I can highlight, for example, the activities around the very successful 100 year anniversary of the FISOC. As one of his early collaborators said, Mark makes things happen. He goes all in and he's a great connector of people whilst also providing solid scientific backing, professional when needed, but also down to earth and makes things fun. We'll come back to that later. <laughs> Mark Cunningham, I think, is not a scientist who wandered the halls of academia to find a research interest drifting from one topic to another. From an early age, Mark was interested in science and was fortunate to have his curiosity about biology encouraged by teachers in his secondary school, Abbey Grammar in Newry. Mark was captivated by brain function by the time he did his final year project in neurophysiology as an undergrad student at Queen's, and this early and consistent interest, I think, is undoubtedly a factor in his rapid progress and remarkable success in the study of epilepsy. From his PhD with Roland Jones in Bristol, Mark went to Leeds, working with two great influences on his career, Everhard Buell and Miles Whittington, which led to a long and productive collaboration. Drilling down to understand normal neurotransmission, the pathophysiology of seizures, and the role of medications in controlling abnormal neuronal activity. After a spell in Heidelberg with Hannah Monier, Mark found himself back in the UK, eventually to Newcastle for 13 years, progressing from research fellow to senior lecturer, then professor in the Institute of Neuroscience. He matured in Newcastle scientifically and as a leader and contributed to some large initiatives like the Can Do Project, and I'm told that this could actually have been named after his attitude. Throughout all of this, Mark's guiding principle has been to improve the understanding of brain function and dysfunction for the improvement of patients' lives. Everyone who works with Mark has remarked on his sheer passion for research. So Mark arrived in Trinity with considerable momentum to build the next phase of his work. It was also the completion of a journey of sorts since growing up in Newry, Mark had regularly passed Trinity on the way to his mother's family in Wexford for holidays, and the idea of what was going on in college fascinated him. 
He also has returned to Ireland with a family, and we are delighted that his wife, Laura, son, James, daughter, Evie, his parents and his sister are here with us this evening. Although rumour has it that the move from England was motivated by their need to be on the right side of Six Nations celebrations, which seems to have been vindicated. <laughs> Since they live in Newry, Mark has a long commute, but even on the train has organized a regular band of commuters to make the best of his time. On top of that, I understand he's a great sport, not slow to take the mic at karaoke, <laughs> will dance to Arctic Monkeys, and is very competitive at pub quizzes. Mark, is there anything that you can't do? His students have described Mark as inspirational, and his PhD supervisor said, Mark is one of the very best research scientists I have ever worked with. I am proud to have been involved in setting him on his way to a very successful career. Though we also noted that Mark's manifestation of his passion included an impressive list of curses and exhortations, which when they went awry, when things went awry, were delivered at a volume sufficient to be detected on the floors below and above our labs. So, Professor Cunningham, I invite you, maybe without that particular manifestation of your passion, if possible, to present your inaugural lecture, Hacking the Brain's Accelerator, Novel Therapies for Epilepsy. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, so a lot of interesting research that went on there to generate that, but thanks very much for your kind words. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming this evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to stand here and address you. Um, and uh, I suppose it's fair to say, uh, and it's interesting that Brian used this word, uh, that I was a curious child. Um, this is a picture of me actually in Newcastle, in uh, Wexford. Um, and, uh, and I hope that that curious child still exists inside me. Um, the curiosity to think, to collect and to observe is germane to the process of scientific inquiry. And the great reformer of medical and higher education in the United States, Abraham Flexner, wrote that curiosity, which may or may not eventuate in something useful, is probably the outstanding characteristic of modern thinking. So in addition to revealing secrets, Curiosity is also a scientific tool that allows us to search for truth and to overcome uncertainty. But how do we practice and facilitate curiosity? Well, one of the first places that we do this is in our places of education. And I'm grateful to an early educational experience that provided me with opportunities to indulge my curiosity. It's quite nice that my biology teacher, Jared Hughes, is, is in the audience here. and. Uh, Jared um, was an absolutely fantastic advocate of participation in the uh, Young Scientist at this stage, sponsored by, by Erlingus. And I actually could have been an environmental scientist. This was the project that, that I did uh, back then. Um, and, uh, but this set me on a path of curiosity to try and understand how science could be done and what we could do with science. Now, Jared also, uh, introduced me to this, which is um, uh, the synapse. And what you're seeing here is this is a very high powered image that has been taken from some human brain tissue. And I'll return to that later on in my lecture. And what you can see here is this is the synapse. This is the, these are the connections that take place in the brain between brain cells. And so you have neurotransmitter, which is located here, and that then diffuses across this thin uh, section, this thin gap here, which is called a synaptic cleft, and then acts on the postsynaptic cell to cause uh, the neurotransmitter to excite or inhibit the next cell. Now, when I teach, and I teach, for example, in this lecture theatre, I teach students, and that's an important part of what I do, I try to teach them about how brain cells operate. And I always use this quote from Terry Pratchett, which says that human beings are little bags of thinking water held up briefly by fragile accumulations of calcium. Um, and what do these thinking, uh, these thinking bags look like, these thinking bags of water? Well, this is what they look like. And these, this is a human brain cell, again, that we've recorded from in the lab. I'll tell you a little bit more about how we've done that. But again, it's the connections between these cells 
that allow us to do the heavy computational load that allows us to do cognitive function and allows us to process information that's coming in from the outer world. Now, how we do that is by a process called electrophysiology. And how do you define electrophysiology? And I'm going to try and give you a bit of a electrophysiology 101 here so that I can take you along the rest of this journey and make sure uh, that you understand what I'm talking about. So if you go to the uh, dictionary, electrophysiology is the branch of physiology that deals with the electrical phenomenon associated with nervous and other bodily activity. But the real definition is that it's like any other science, but much cooler, okay? And um, it's always interesting to think uh, about um, uh, electrophysiology, as Brian alluded to, it can be incredibly frustrating. It's hard work, it's very detailed, um, and you can have many days where you're not getting any successful experiments to work. And so it really can seem like a, a sort of training in the school of hard knocks. Um, and how electrophysiologists see themselves, um, this is interesting, this was a, a tweet from a scientific uh, equipment company that, that I've bought equipment from, but it describes us, the activity as our electrophysiologists of being quite picky and, and also displaying paranoid uh, behavior. So this is really how electrophysiologists see ourselves. We're kind of obsessive, compulsive, paranoid uh, people that are trying to do these experiments in the lab. Um, and but really, how other scientists see us is, is as these kind of wizard wizards that speak in this kind of really weird language. Um, but I like this because what we're trying to do is shine light into how the brain operates. Um, and how we do that is with a, a, a multitude of techniques and technology. And what these techniques do is they allow us to essentially understand how the brain, the nervous tissue, is operating both in space and in time. So what we can do in the lab is we can uh, look at what is up, uh, occurring at these synaptic connections, which I told you about, but also at the level of what is happening at individual brain cells. So this is the microscopic scale, but we can then also go up to the mesoscopic scale. And you'll see a lot of these types of recordings as I go through the lecture, where we're now looking at what local networks, cortical microcircuits are doing in terms of their ability to generate organized electrical activity. And ultimately, this organized electrical activity, which we call local two potentials, is what gives rise to the EEG, the electroencephalogram. This is a critical tool from a clinical perspective that's used uh, on a daily basis in hospitals to try and understand something in a non-invasive manner about how the brain is operating. And that is where we get to the macroscopic scale. So I just want to give you a few more little insights, which I think are quite important in terms of the message that I'm trying to get across in uh, later on in this lecture about some of the exciting, exciting research that we're doing. And the first thing to understand is that if you take a brain cell, that it has these small ion, these small pores, which are called ion channels, and that these allow charged uh, ions, sodium and calcium, to pass through. And that when these charged positive ions move into the cell, these destabilize the membrane. So these are known as uh, depolarizing. They cause the neurons to be excited. Now, on the other side of this, uh, this balance here, we then have the movement of negatively charged ions, chloride, into the cell, or we can get the movement of positively charged potassium ions out of the cell. And what this does is this stabilizes the neuron. It calms it down. And this is known as hyperpolarization. So individual neurons have their own intrinsic excitability. Now, in addition to that, uh, what we have is we have specialized cells within the central nervous system, within the brain. And broadly speaking, these cells can either be excitatory, they provide excitation, uh, they're called principal cells. These are reconstructions of cells that we've recorded from in the lab. This is a, a, a real uh, pyramidal uh, or principal cell that you're seeing here. And they operate by making connections between one another that are called glutamate synapses. And this is what I refer to when I talk about the accelerator. Glutamate is an abundant biomolecule. And in our brain, what it does is it acts to excite or accelerate brain activity. It causes one cell to excite another. And this 
causes a depolarizing effect and it will promote neuronal firing. Now, on the other side of this balance, what we have is inhibition. So we have these much more complex looking cells, which are called interneurons. They use a different neurotransmitter, which is called GABA, and this is hyperpolarizing. And what this does is that when GABA acts on another cell, it suppresses neuronal firing. So um, when we think about the brain, uh, one of the interesting ways to think about it is that if we think about the brain, the human brain, in terms of numbers, there are 100 billion neurons in the human brain. That's roughly the same number of uh, stars uh, in the Milky Way. And there's estimated to be a quadrillion synapses uh, in the human brain that connect those cells. So this is an incredibly complex organ to try and work on. And I love this quote from Charles Sherrington. Sherrington won the Nobel Prize because he discovered synapses. And um, I'll come back to Sherrington at the end of my lecture. Um, but this is a beautiful quote here where he talks about the brain is waking and with it is the mind is returning. It is as if the Milky Way entered upon some cosmic dance. Swiftly, the head mass becomes an enchanted moon where millions of flashing shuttles weave a dissolving pattern, always a meaningful pattern though never an abiding one, a shifting harmony of sub-patterns. And what I'm trying to allude to here is that the brain operates through these billions of cells and quadrillion of synapses to give rise to coherent activity, organized electrical activity. And when that activity is, 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 is balanced, then the brain is happy. But as you'll see, that can go out of balance as well, and things can go badly wrong. So I sometimes refer to this as the EI balance, um, where we can generate this net, these network rhythms or oscillations, which is what we study in the lab. This is a gamma frequency oscillation. You're hopefully all generating gamma now because you're doing higher order cognition, listening to me, watching me. Um, you're hopefully not generating delta because that would mean you're all asleep. Um, and, and as you can see here, there is a balance between excitation and inhibition, which gives rise to this activity. Now, things can go out of balance. You can get changes in terms of the balance of uh, glutamate and GABA. You can get changes at the level of the intrinsic excitability of neurons. And when that happens, things go badly wrong. And I apology, my apologies, I'm not being ageist here in terms of the age demographic in this. Uh, it was just the best example I could see of a, of a sort of catastrophic seesaw incident, okay? So a good example of when things go wrong is epilepsy. What is epilepsy? It's a neurological condition that's characterized by recurrent seizures. And seizures are brief disturbances in the electrical activity uh, of the brain. And um, seizures uh, are essentially a core part of, of what epilepsy is. Now, epilepsy has multiple causes. Can, arise due to an infection within the brain, due to um, a head injury, due to there's a strong genetic component now, which we understand, due to perinatal or prenatal brain damage, uh, brain tumors, which I'm going to focus on in the sort of second half of my talk. And then uh, aging is now, there's a lot of work that suggests during uh, neurodegenerative disorders that epilepsy is, is also uh, found. Um, and then there are many unknown causes as well. And globally, there are 50 million people living with epilepsy. One in, one in 115 people in Ireland have epilepsy. So there's approximately 45,000 people living with epilepsy in Ireland today, making it one of the most common neurological conditions in the country. And anyone can develop epilepsy at any age. And of course, the diagnosis is based on a number of clinical tests, history and clinical opinion. And the diagnosis usually is based on two or more unprovoked seizures. And this is what we study in the lab. This is a seizure that we've recorded in the lab that we can record in our brain slices. Um, and we use this as a model to try and interrogate the mechanisms that give rise to this aberrant activity, and then how we can essentially ameliorate this activity in terms of novel treatments. Now, I want to just tell you a little bit about my journey. You've heard a little bit about it, but it's quite important because I wanted to highlight some of the key things that have happened and how that has led me to study uh, epilepsy. 
Um, as the Dean mentioned, I started off my scientific career uh, in uh, doing my undergraduate degree in Queens with Norman Schofield, who was my final year project supervisor. I then moved to Bristol to do uh, my um, MRC studentship, uh, PhD studentship with Roland Jones. And with Roland, what I was doing was I was recording from individual brain cells. This is a brain cell here in a slice visualized down a powerful microscope. And this is a glass pipette that we place onto the neuron, and then we can record the electrical signals that are being generated by that are being generated or that or the, this brain cell is receiving. And this was very productive. This was where I really got interested in epilepsy. Uh, I published a number of papers looking at the effect of a number of anti-seizure medications on transmitter release. Um, and, uh, and then decided to move to Leeds, where I worked with Eberhard Buhl and Miles Whittington. Sadly, Eberhard died in uh, 2003 from an autoimmune condition, and Miles passed away in 2021 from leukemia. But they had a tremendous influence um, on my career. Uh, Miles was a very tall, uh, uh, very loud Yorkshire man. Uh, very enthusiastic about science. You would go into his office and show him some results. And the first thing he would say would be, bully nature, lad, bully nature. Uh, he felt everything could be published in nature. Uh, uh, now, of course, he published three times in nature even before he got tenured. So it was easy for him to say that. But that enthusiasm was infectious. It really meant that, you know, you, you felt you were doing something of value and to have somebody behind you there giving you that support was fantastic. Um, and when I was with uh, Eberhard and Miles, my um, interest really moved from this microscopic level more to this mesoscopic level. So I was now doing recordings. This is a hippocampal slice here. This is the part of your brain that's important for learning and memory. Um, and we were doing recordings to try and now look at this network activity. And um, so we did a lot of work looking at gamma frequency oscillations, characterizing this activity in regions for the first time in exquisite detail, demonstrating for the first time using an animal model psychiatric illness that there was specific reduction in these uh, inhibitory interneurons, and then moving out into the neocortex and starting to define some new mechanistic features of the gamma oscillations uh, in the neocortex. I, I then did a, a brief sojourn in, in Heidelberg, which was a fantastic experience. Um, Professor Hannah Monnier, who's based at the University of Heidelberg, but also worked very closely with the Max Planck Institute there. And what Hannah was, was, is, is renowned for really is her ability to generate these sort of state-of-the-art transgenic animals. And what we could do here is we could look at very specific manipulations of these, uh, these glutamate uh, receptors on particular cell classes and then start to ask something about how that, uh, how that contributed to both network function and also ultimately to uh, behavior. I then moved back to Newcastle and again uh, with Miles um, and really uh, did a lot of work during this time with, with Roger Tribe. I, I collaborated with Roger when I was in Leeds. It's a delight that Roger and his wife Stephanie are in the audience this evening. Roger is visiting from IBM. He's one of our visiting professors through the School of Medicine uh, program. Um, and we've had a really good week talking about science, drinking the odd glass of whiskey. Uh, so, um, and, and, and this collaboration uh, led to some important work where we really now started to move away from animal models uh, and started to interrogate human uh, cortical networks. So we demonstrated, for example, using neurosurgical samples. So this is a, a case here, it's called temporal lobe epilepsy, where you have a, a scarred hippocampus uh, and this can be removed by the neurosurgeons to try and treat the epilepsy. But we obtain the tissue from theater, keep the tissue alive, and then we can record from the brain cells, these human brain cells in a lab environment. So this now allows us to ask questions, not in terms of animal models, but actually with diseased human pathological tissue. So we published a number of papers here. Um, and what we did was we focused very much on, you see, I use the word here, gap junction or non-synaptic. So I just want to explain that because I've kind of told you a little bit of a lie so far that it's really only sort of these chemical connections between brain cells. So yes, neurons communicate with one another using uh, this, this uh, process where an action potential comes down into the presynaptic terminal. 
Uh, it causes calcium to flood in. That causes the release of neurotransmitter, in this case, glutamate. And that glutamate then acts on postsynaptic receptors to cause a, a, a depolarization and postsynaptic potential. Um, and you can see that one of the drawbacks of this is that there is a significant delay. Okay, it's only milliseconds, but in the brain, that's a long amount of time. Okay. But what we now know, and work that I've done with Roger, is that there is another type of connection within the brain. And this is a direct connection where cells are directly coupled, electrically coupled to one another. So the presynaptic neuron is directly connected to the, via these connections, which are proteins that allow the direct flow of ions from one cell to another. So what that means is that you have an action potential in this cell, and this gets propagated it's slightly uh, reduced in its amplitude, but the timing is much more precise. And that's very important when you start to think about how neurons can be synchronized, particularly in a seizure-like uh, event. And Roger and I continue to collaborate. This is just a recent paper here where we've been looking at um, some, uh, again, Roger's computational models uh, have made some predictions. And in this case, this is data that I had collected, I think, almost 15 years ago, 15 or 16 years ago. Um, and uh, there's an interesting little story here that I said, still had all of the CDs that I backed up all the data on. And I still had all of my own lab books. So if there's any early career researchers, back up your data and keep good lab books, okay? The only problem was that I had all these CDs, but I didn't have a bloody CD player. So, so I then had to go on the scrounge to find a CD player that can connect to an Apple Mac. Um, but we managed to get the data out, and, and this is the fruit uh, of that um, process. Um, so 2018, I moved back to, um, to Dublin. Uh, and again, very much um, uh, th very thankful to um, Alan Mason Bates, um, who, uh, who uh, gave the, 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 the donation to college to create the two chairs. Um, and, um, and when one comes back to Dublin, what you realize is that you can't escape James Joyce, OK? And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use Joyce to just tell you a little story about sort of some of the new work that we're doing here now in Dublin, which is funded by the Science Foundation Ireland. And um, now, I'm sure there are Joyce aficionados in the audience, but do you know that there's a link to epilepsy in Ulysses. So uh, this is a section, rubber goods, never rip, brand is supplied to the aristocracy, corsets for men, I cure fits or money refunded. Okay. So I cure fits, this is a, an advert from the Salt Lake Herald in 1887. And what, what happened then is that, you know, a lot of the medicines were advertised. Uh, there was a lot of sort of very dubious activities, but this medicine that emerged in the mid 19th century is a medicine called bromide. And bromide um, it was used uh, for a number of years uh, to, to treat epilepsy. And this mail order culture of cures was a pervasive part of Dublin life, which Joyce existed in and was, was actually used as an inspiration for uh, Ulysses. And the inspiration is this gentleman here, Alfred, uh, H. Uh, Henry Hunter, um, and uh, I love this ad, Epicure, the great improved Irish remedy for epilepsy fits and kindred ailments, contains no bromide um, uh, and can be obtained by applying by letter to Alfred Hunter. Um, uh, and it, what's interesting here is he says, formerly partner, Trench's remedy. So Trench's remedy was another one of these uh, remedies which did create, which did contain bromide. So I'm not really sure what was in this. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of sort of snake oil stuff that went on back then. But Hunter is a really interesting character. He was an ad canvasser. And of course, we know that Joyce had a real penchant for using identifiable figures in his literature and particularly in Ulysses. Um, and there's a story that supposedly uh, Hunter rescued Joyce from a drunken fight and took him home and showed him some sort of paternal sympathy that resonated deeply with Joyce. And so it's believed that Joyce modeled Leopold Bloom on Hunter um, and that his interaction with Hunter was pivotal in evolving 
Ulysses, which at that stage was a short story, into the version that we that we know. Now, Hunter was uh, was uh, an interesting character. Oh, what has happened there? Oh, sorry, that's fine. Yeah, he was an interesting character, um, and he also. And um, going back to the quote from Ulysses, Hunter actually also submitted a patent for uh, a device that would help to unlace boots, shoes and corsets. So, again, this suggests that there probably was some truth in him as, as being an inspiration for Leopold Bloom. But you can see that, again, a number of these cures, the, the trenches remedy, these are all bromide based. So they were being uh, supplied in Dublin, supplied in Belfast. And here's Old Moore's Almanac. So in 1944, still, still available, this uh, trenches remedy. Now, of course, when we think about treatments for epilepsy, um, there are some pretty horrific stories in terms of how epilepsy has been treated. So, you know, if you go back and read the, the ancient literature, um, the blood of fallen gladiators was used as a cure, um, exorcism commonly used as a cure, and of course, trepanning. And before we start to get all very smug about this and think, oh, you know, we would never do that in modern times, this is a, a series of pictures from an article that was published in, in, in Norway, again, showing a number of cures that were used uh, for epilepsy uh, in the 19th century. This is a magic bag filled with all sorts of herbs and potions that was kept on the person uh, that was suffering from epilepsy. Uh, bleeding was also a common cure. And yes, you are seeing this, a child being shoved through a tree was also a cure as well, okay? So um, now the real changer was bromide because bromide was actually the first attempt to use a pharmacological approach, a, a drug that could be given to a patient to stop seizures. Um, and this gentleman here was the first to do it, Charles uh, Lowcock, uh, who was Queen Victoria's um, physician and he um, first started to give this to, to women that were suffering from what was then called hysterical uh, epilepsy, but what we now know, now know as catamenial epilepsy. This is epilepsy that is associated with the menstrual cycle. And um, there's, again, at this time, they didn't have a clue about what bromide was doing, but what we now know, because we now have the electrophysiological techniques to understand this, is that bromide essentially increases these stabilizing forces that I told you about at the start of the lecture. It interacts with the GABA receptors. Um, and what it does is essentially, it is um, increasing neuronal hyper, hyperpolarization. So it's stabilizing the brain cells and calming everything down. And again, I'll come back to this because this is an interesting mechanism that is in some way connected to the science that we're doing uh, in the lab at the minute. Now, this is an interesting graph because it shows you that um, bromide came onto uh, the, uh, the scene in terms of uh, its use as an anti-seizure medication um, in 1860. Uh, and this just shows the uh, progression of number of anti-seizure medications that have been approved for clinical use from that time right up to now. And you can see that there's a lot of drugs here. Now, the one thing that I would say is that many of these drugs have been discovered in a serendipitous manner. You know, the researchers have not set out to say, I want to create a drug that will treat epilepsy. It's a chance observation in a lab, or it may be a case of repurposing where a drug was designed to treat something else and perhaps didn't work so good for that. Uh, so they decided to use it uh, for, for epilepsy as an anti-seizure medication. The more interesting graph is that if we then look at the number of anti-epileptic drugs in over time, but on this, uh, this side, we look at drug resistance. So a key feature of epilepsy is that around about 30% of patients are termed refractory. Now, what this means is that they may be on multiple anti-seizure medications, but they're not getting adequate seizure control. And that number hasn't really changed that much since that type of data has started to be collected. So have we got something badly wrong here? Um, I need to be careful because I know there's neurologists in the, in the, in the audience. I don't want to offend anybody, particularly Colin. Uh, well, what, what I'm going to suggest is that I think we've got it wrong, but, but potentially from our end, from the preclinical end, because again, a lot of these drugs have been developed in the lab and then have to do 
this thing which is called cross the valley of death. So when you do preclinical science that is trying to um, push uh, into translation, so you're trying to do something that might cross over into human, into human use, into uh, patient use, um, the valley of death is a big issue. And drug design and development um, it constantly falls down into this valley of death where a drug or a treatment is designed in the lab. And then when they try and translate it into clinical trials into patients, everything completely falls apart. And my theory on this, because I'm allowed to do that now, um, is that we are potentially not using the right model. So does anybody know who this gentleman is? Exactly, yes. And Nora Wiener said, the best material model for a cat is another cat, or preferably the same cat. And what I'm going to try and convince you is that the best model for human epilepsy is a human, okay? So again, um, this was alluded to that uh, we, we tried to address this by saying, well, let's try and study human epileptic tissue to understand something about what's going on. And in Newcastle, we did this work where we were able to obtain neurosurgical um, uh, tissue with ethical consent from the patient, uh, take it to the lab, keep it alive, and then record from that tissue. And we were able to demonstrate that there are particular signatures that are unique to this epileptic tissue. And again, this work demonstrated that these signals arise from these electrical connections between brain cells. So most of the anti-seizure medications that we have that are available operate on chemical synapses, um, but none of them target uh, uh, electrical synapses. So this suggests that there might be a novel approach in terms of targeting gap junctions to stop this epileptic activity. So, um, so again, I've been very, I've been a passionate advocate for this and um, trying to suggest that using human brain tissue is, is an important uh, device, particularly for epilepsy research. And um, we've published a number of papers on this. Um, I still continue to use animal models, but again, one of the things that we do as, uh, as scientists is that, that use animals is that we have to adhere to the three R's, which are reduction, refinement, and replacement. And so by using human tissue, that allows us to essentially adhere to those important, uh, those important principles because we can look to either refine or replace our animal models with human uh, tissue approaches. And this is very important, and it's come very sharply into focus, given the, the recent move in the United States. And um, just ignore the fact that this was uh, this act was sponsored by Rand Paul. I uh, will not talk about his uh, political uh, uh, viewpoints, which are very, very far away from mine. Um, but it is interesting because what the suggestion now is that the FDA no longer has to require animal testing for new drugs. And of course, that means that that puts a focus on using human derived tissues or human derived cells as a way, uh, an important way for drug design and development. And the exciting thing is that we're now doing this here in Dublin. So I remember at my interview for this position, there was some consternation that I hadn't reached out to the neurosurgeons or I didn't know any of the neurosurgeons. Um, but we've now managed to set it up, uh, working with uh, Donica uh, O'Brien and Kieran Sweeney, we're able now to collect human tissue. So this is human brain tissue here. And then we can cut these sections, thin sections on this device here, which is called a vibratome. Uh, and so what you're seeing here are live human brain slices. Um, I'm working with uh, my PhD student, Austin Lacey, and his co-supervisor, Norman Delante, uh, and others in the Future Neuro Project. We've been able to demonstrate um, in the lab at the Beaumont Hospital that we can now do these, this, these types of recordings here in Dublin, um, and that this uh, activity is, you know, it matches what one would see from a clinical point of view in terms of these seizure-like events. You have pre-ectal activity, you have tonic activity, and you have clonic activity. And what's even more exciting is that um, uh, we've just found out uh, that uh, an MRC-funded project, which is called the UK Brain BioLink Project, uh, which uh, Trinity College Dublin um, uh, is involved in. So I'm uh, the lead for um, the, the designated lead for the multi-center live nervous tissue collaboration. 
um, has been funded and that's going to run for the next two years. Um, and again, this is an important project because it's looking at issues like consent ethics, patient and public involvement, looking at new cohorts and uh, biological resources for the neuroscience research, looking at issues of tissue preservation, quality control analysis and distribution, and also data integration, uh, visualization and open access. Um, and one of the exciting things, for example, that we're hopefully going to do is look at these sort of lab on a chip approaches for live human brain slices. Um, which will allow us to uh, do some very interesting recordings um, from the human brain tissue. Now, the final bit of the talk is where I want to talk about my sort of primary research interest at the minute. And I alluded to earlier on that I'm very interested in brain tumor related epilepsy. And again, I want to start this from the perspective of the patient. This is a, a gentleman who presented uh, to my colleagues in Newcastle uh, with generalized seizures. Uh, there was an initial diagnosis of left frontal grade to astrocytoma. This is a particular type of brain tumor. And in this case, the gentleman underwent the bulking tumor surgery. And again, these are the types of patients that we're recruiting here in Dublin to look at the tissue around the tumor for our studies in the lab. Now, in terms of brain tumor related epilepsy, there's a lot going on. But the main thing to really focus on is this area around the tumor which is called the peritumoral region, or as I sometimes like to call it, the badlands. Because what we have here is we have infiltrating cancer cells that are rubbing up against normal, healthy brain cells. And this is where the seizures are arising from this area, this penumbra of tissue around the tumor. And one of the things that we've got very interested in is that in this area, there are increased levels of our old friend, the accelerator of glutamate. How do we know this? Well, this is my PhD student in Newcastle, uh, Ashan Jayakashira, he's a neurosurgical trainee, and he's been using an approach whereby he's been recruiting patients with brain tumor-related epilepsy, uh, with and without seizures. Um, and what he's doing is they're doing um, a process called um, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. So they're getting structural data, but they're also using a, a sophisticated approach, which is called magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And what that means is that you can then look at particular levels of, of molecules of interest and try and measure the amount of that molecule in the tissue. In this case, you're looking for a glutamate peak. And Ashan's data suggests that in the patients that have a history of seizures, that the glutamate level is significantly increased over those patients who do not. So what's going on here? Well, again, we go back to our little model here of our synapse the glutamate gets released from the synapse. We also know that we have other cells in the brain called astrocytes. What they do is they're very important because they, they hoover up glutamate, but they can release small amounts of glutamate. Um, and in, the, uh, in the, the, the normal condition, in the physiological condition, this transporter, which is called system XC, releases very small amounts of glutamate. But most of the glutamate is coming from the presynaptic terminals. Now, in the case of a brain tumor, the gliomas hijack this glutamate um, signaling system, and we get an increase of these transporters in the glioma cell, and there's now tons of glutamate that's floating around in the brain tissue. Now, if there's too much glutamate in brain tissue, that's not a good thing. It can kill brain cells, okay? And it can also cause hyperexcitability, meaning that you get seizure activity arising. Now, the other thing is that this excessive glutamate also feeds back onto the glioma cell and actually causes then the glioma cells to grow more and to move more. So ultimately what you have is you have this really insidious sort of feedback cycle whereby the excessive glutamate promotes seizure activity. It also promotes cell death and excitotoxicity. But then every time you have a seizure, that then promotes more glutamate release, which feeds back onto the glioma cells and causes the tumor to grow more. So you have glutamate essentially involved not only in epileptogenesis, but also oncogenesis as well, the growth of the tumor. So we've been looking at ways that we might target these systems as a primary outcome to try and reduce the seizures, either by targeting system XC, uh, XC here or by targeting the postsynaptic AMP receptors that are located on, on the postsynaptic neurons. But of course, pharmacology 
is a bit of a can be a bit of a crude approach, um, and I'll talk more about that uh, in the next couple of slides. So what we're trying to do is take a pretty novel approach, which is associated with worms. Now, if you say worms to um, parents of children of a certain age, it will induce panic and fear, okay? There will be a mad rushing to find Ovex or whatever else you use. Um, but worms are have been fascinating uh, creatures, particularly from a neuroscience research point of view. Um, and I'm gonna show you now how worms are an important part of what we're trying to do in terms of develop a novel therapy for brain tumor related epilepsy. So you're probably all familiar, or you may be familiar with this drug, which is called ivermectin. It kind of got a bit of a sort of bad name during the whole COVID thing. Um, but there's a Trinity connection to ivermectin. So William Campbell, who was a graduate here, essentially came up with ivermectin. And of course, we know that worms are not just a worry for parents of a certain age, but worms are a significant health issue, particularly in the developing world, both for human health, but also for veterinary health as well. And what Campbell did was he essentially came up with a drug that could specifically target these, these worms and, and, and cause them uh, to, to, to be treated. And how that works is that this is our little worm here. So worms basically just like to eat, uh, move, and you know what, uh, and also do you know what as well to make more worms. Um, uh, and what happens is that, of course, uh, to eat, they need to be able to move. So they have these connections, um, which we've zoomed in here, where glutamate is released, uh, and it acts on a motor neuron. So the motor neuron causes the muscles to move, to contract which causes the worm to move. Um, and the glutamate gets released, but the glutamate acts on a receptor here, which is called a glutamate-activated chloride channel. So when uh, glutamate binds to this channel, this negatively charged anion moves into the cell. And remember, that will hyperpolarize okay, uh, the neuron. Now, in the, the worm, that's actually important for how these worms move. But what ivermectin does is it blocks it and that then causes neuromuscular paralysis. The worms can't eat and they die and they're passed out. So what we're trying to do now in the lab is we're now trying to take this um, the glutamate activated chloride channel, the protein from worms. Uh, we are essentially, this protein is an ion channel that opens in response to glutamate. We are taking the gene for this protein. We modify it to alter the sensitivity to glutamate. So you can essentially titrate the sensitivity. And then what we're doing is we're using a virus promoter to insert the DNA into specific neurons in the brain that are around the tumor. And these are the neurons that are causing this epileptic activity. And so we now have a system where you can pause neurons to stop firing in the presence of elevated glutamate. So we're kind of trying to hack the system to essentially suppress this aberrant firing. And we're going to hopefully test this in human tissue using a, an approach called organotypic slices, where we can keep the slices alive for many, many weeks. So in some cases, up to six weeks long. And what that means is that we have a sufficient time window to introduce the, the lenti vector system to express the modified um, glutamate-activated chloride channel in the brain cells and test the hypothesis that this will suppress epileptic activity. So what we're trying to do really is develop a novel gene therapy approach for brain tumor related epilepsy. The primary objective of course, is that it will suppress seizures, but there could be a secondary objective is that it might actually slow down the growth of the tumor as well, given the critical role of glutamate. And why this is important is this goes back to my comments about pharmacology. At the minute we know, um, you know, in this case, this is patients with brain tumor related epilepsy, but it could be any type of patient that they will get a therapy and that if you look at the uh, efficacy across the population, in some patients you get an effect, in some patients you get no effect, and in some patients you get an adverse effect. What we're trying to do is really use an approach which is called precision medicine, whereby we have patients with epilepsy, with brain tumor-related epilepsy, we're trying to look at the phenotype, we're trying to look at blood, DNA, tissue, imaging, neurophysiology, to characterize the pathophysiology in more detail, and then apply very precise therapeutic approaches 
that will hopefully pr produce a good effect in those patient cohorts. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, that's the science done with, you'd be glad to hear, uh, is I just want to talk about another passion of mine. Um, and this is um, art and science. And art and science have their meeting point in method. And this um, was a collaboration that arose during COVID. Um, so at that time, the science, oh, sorry, at that time, Science Gallery uh, had the rapid residencies. There was a call that went out. I answered the email and said, yeah, I'd love to be involved in that. And I was partnered up with this gentleman who's in the audience, Owen Boss, who works for Anu Productions. Um, and uh, Owen and I then spent the rest of COVID lockdown talking to each other over Zoom, developing ideas. Um, and uh, those ideas came to fruition alongside some other people. This is, um, uh, uh, you see Emily Howard and Rosie Middleton uh, and Bohan Fan. Uh, and these are, these people work at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester. Uh, and this is a visit that they did to Emma where we were trying to develop ideas for a project. And that um, project came to fruition at the back end of last year. Um, Owen was particularly inspired by what we talked about in, in reference to Sherrington and this idea of the enchanted loom. And uh, Owen used this to essentially create a number of tapestries using a digital loom uh, in, in the United States. And these, these, loom, these tapestries have been inspired by certain aspects of Owen's wife's journey with, uh, with tumor-related uh, epilepsy. So there's particular features here where you can actually see the brain here, or you can see the chemical structure of the anti-seizure medications that Debbie was, was, uh, was receiving. Um, and what I'm gonna do now is I wanna just um, play you a, a recording, um, which also played a pivotal role um, in this collaboration. So I'm just gonna turn this on. Electrode arrays, these are silicon probes, and they have little contacts on them. Place them into the brain tissue, and you can then record the activity of the neurons and the network as it's generating. What we're hearing now, and we then were able to give those recordings to Owen and to the team in Manchester. And what they did was that they were able to use machine learning in a computer assisted compositional tool, which then transposed this neurophysiological signal recorded in human brain uh, and created a novel score of music for the Vernicus Maria uh, exhibition. So uh, this piece of music uh, was um, composed by Emily and performed by Rosie and Stephen Upshaw. Um, and uh, it was a fantastic interaction. It was a real honor and pleasure to be involved in this. Um, and uh, I really enjoy this kind of collaborative venture that brings art and science together. So the the last thing um, I want to say really is just I want to return to my opening comments and the thoughts of Abraham Flexner. And I hope that my curiosity has provided some usefulness and that my presence here now in this institution of learning that is devoted to the cultivation of curiosity will allow me to continue in this pursuit and to inspire students of the value and importance of curiosity. And I just want to thank the various um, environments that I've that I've had the pleasure to study and work in um, and, and continue to interact with. Um, I can't mention everybody, but all of the academics that I've interacted with, the clinicians um, that I've interacted with, um, and I also want to thank uh, the funders and other key stakeholders that um, I have uh, uh, collaborated with. Um, and then the final thing I want to say is just a big thank you to my wife and two kids for their continued love, patience and support. Um, and on that note, I'd just like to thank you.
Thanks, Mark. I think for an exposition that you know we weren't disappointed. We knew it was coming, and we're not uh, disappointed. And what a what a fabulous trip through your work and some of the people you've come across. Um, we don't usually have questions at the end of these lectures, so you are though welcome to come outside and join us some for some refreshments. And I'm sure Mark would be very happy after we let him to slake his thirst a bit to to answer any questions that you do have. So thank you again for coming. Thanks. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I don't have to turn the zoom off. Yeah, I'm going to stop the zoom. Yeah. Just press end, is it? Um,